Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Rob Asibe, Associate Program Director at San Joaquin General Hospital Family Medicine Residency Program and new Physician Director here at California Academy of Family Physicians. And we know that addiction medicine is family medicine. Did you know that only one in five people with opioid use disorder receive treatment? We'd like to change those odds. In our latest series, we bring you stories of doctors and their patients who have worked together to reduce the harm done by opioid use disorder. These brief stories will bring you into the hearts and the minds of our guests. We hope that this will inspire you to do everything in your power to bring medical attention to the opioid use disorder patients in your practice. Hey, Tipu, here we are again with our third episode in our series, One in Five, Increasing the Odds for OUD Patients. Now, I'm not quite sure how you can top a conversation with a patient who successfully navigated their treatment and the interview with Dr. Lasher about his incredible work, but tell me a little bit more about what we're going to hear in this episode today. Yeah, thanks, Rob. That was a great episode. But coming up, we're going to talk a little bit more about how you get that first prescription written. Oftentimes, these patients are they're tough, right? They're interacting with a broken healthcare system. And in order to really provide proper care and treatment for them, we all need to be ready in all of our different settings to write that prescription. So in this next episode, we're going to really delve into how that can be done in a busy emergency department setting. Exactly. Did you know that overdose is killing more Americans than car accidents and gunshot wounds combined every single year? I heard that from Dr. K. Lind in this episode, I believe. Yeah, Dr. Lynn brings us right into the ER on this one. She really connects it all back to primary care and tips and tricks that we can all use to battle our own biases and stigma and the outcomes you can get, which are often really good once we can get over that hurdle and get that prescription written, Rob. That's awesome. I'm super eager to hear this from Dr. Lynn and to try to learn more. Thanks again, Tipu. Appreciate you. Hi, I'm Tipu Khan. I'm a family physician and addiction specialist, and I'm joined today with Dr. Kay Lin from Highland Hospital. Hey, Kay. Hi, it's nice to be here with y'all tonight. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you. Yeah, thank you for taking the time. Tell me a little bit about yourself. What does your practice look like? Where are you working? Fill me in. Sure. So I grew up in Dallas and New Orleans and left the South to go to emergency medicine residency at Maimonides in Brooklyn. And I loved the being there. It was great. I did a medical education fellowship and was in New York for about six years. And then in 2014, I moved to Oakland, to the East Bay for family reasons, and joined Highland in 2015. And have spent most of the time since then doing Highland emergency medicine and a mixture of other emergency medicine sites around the Bay. But then starting about two years ago in 2022, I joined the Highland Bridge team half-time. So I'm half-time in addiction medicine and half-time in the emergency department. I came to that because I loved emergency medicine. I loved medical education. The opportunities Highland was giving me to do both those things was really spectacular. And I'm very lucky to be there. I don't know how much experience the people listening have with what emergency medicine used to have to offer to people who are suffering from substance use disorder and the effects of substance misuse. But even when I started 2008, 2010, which wasn't that long ago, all things considered, it was a much more brutalistic approach. It was kind of like the best we had to offer was life-saving treatment for alcohol withdrawal or Narcan or some empathy. But what most people got was just told that we had nothing to do to help them or downright scolded and told to leave. And it was this vicious cycle of providers that I knew cared because I watched them be so empathic and compassionate with other patients. And I couldn't figure out what it was that had led people to this very burnt out, resentful relationship with this group of people who were so obviously suffering from this life-threatening disease process. And I think part of it was just the powerlessness that we perceived ourselves as having really nothing to offer to help. And then watching addiction medicine become a thing really over the last decade and having buprenorphine to offer and start in the ED and having multimodal treatment for alcohol use disorder and tobacco use disorder and all these other things that previously we had anything from nothing to very, very little. It's really inspiring to get to be part of a group of providers who are practicing cutting edge medicine and helping people that would otherwise die from the diseases they have 
So it's great to be here. Okay, thanks for being on the front lines, really battling this epidemic over the last decade or so. And it is interesting to see how it's evolved over the last few years. I think one of the interesting things we've noticed is really how there's been a gap and also a shift in the paradigm of what we do with these patients once they leave the emergency department. It sounds like you're using a lot of buprenorphine and feel comfortable starting buprenorphine in the emergency department setting. Any tips or pearls or tricks you have? Because I imagine when you're doing this, you've got a busy department and you need to get this patient feeling better quickly. Otherwise, you lose these patients to follow up. And I think we face a similar context in the primary care setting where we've got these patients with us. We've got to get them treated quickly and get them feeling better as quickly as we can to really gain their trust. So what are your tips and advice on how you actually manage that buprenorphine start and how could that apply to those of us in primary care? Give it a try a few times. And once you have prescribed it a few times, you get more comfortable with it and Take a look at the resources that are out there before you start prescribing it, if you can, and in real time. Highland Bridge has a website. California Bridge, which is now just Bridge and is a national movement, has a website with very easy to understand handouts for patients and for providers in how to start somebody on buprenorphine based on what drugs they're using and the stage of withdrawal they come in at. I think sometimes people get very nervous about understandably so, about medicines they've never prescribed before or about something that has this reputation for causing precipitated withdrawal, which is so miserable. But oftentimes the patients will be able to tell you very explicitly how they're going to start Suboxone if they've done it before. And you can follow their lead if what they're saying is in line with what you're reading about and lean on local experts. The chances are that there's someone working either with you or near you who is a champion for substance use disorder care in some way or another and we'll be able to tell you in real time how to manage a patient if you're not quite sure or tell you what resources there are. In the Bay Area, there's a warm line that providers can call to get further direction for complex cases. So leverage your local resources because they're there for sure. Great. Yeah, there's local resources out there, like you mentioned, the warm line. And also a quick plug for the CAFP MOUD Champions website familydocs.org slash S-U-D. You can log on there and request a peer support physician to help you through your first couple of prescriptions. So CAFP has some resources you all may want to refer to out there as well. Kate, next question I'd like to ask you is, what can we do as primary care to help close that gap for what happens after they leave the department? Of course, it takes a team and takes a village to manage opiate use disorder appropriately. If you had a magic wand, once you discharge your patient with a buprenorphine prescription, what can we do on our side when we see them in clinic for follow-up? So I think a lot of it goes into, unfortunately, the social determinants of health and the systemic determinants of health that led to that person's despair, perhaps, and decisions to use if they had developed a use disorder, some of which we can address and some of which are going to be far beyond what any healthcare system can do to help any one person. But I guess in terms of how to help that person not slip through the cracks and bridge the gap into complete care, just follow up with them closely. Like We in the ED can also do a better job making sure that primary docs know when their patients go through this to the extent the patient's comfortable with us telling the primary doc, we could be proactively sending you charts more often. But if you know one of your patients overdosed or even just came in in withdrawal, but especially if they came in after an overdose that got reversed, the chance that they are going to then die from opioid use disorder is high. The same mortality as non-ST elevation MI in the next year after an overdose. So it's an extremely high risk time for patients. But it's also a time when often there are other resources that are not available. And so like if a person's phone is not working, it can be very hard to keep up with them and hard for them to keep up with everything else. If they don't have transportation, they can't come to their appointments. So trying to stay in touch with the person and help them stay engaged and help make sure whatever social determinant of health is a barrier to their care and wellness is being addressed is how a primary doctor could help bridge the gap between surviving and your death experience and not getting lost to follow up. It's really interesting when we look at the number needed to treat for buprenorphine, we find that the number needed to treat to achieve retention and treatment and suppression of illicit opiate use is 
only two, and that's at about 16 milligrams a day. So you just need to treat two people to get that effect. Whereas we look at some of these other things we do in primary care, such as statin for MI prevention, the number needed to treat for a statin and MI prevention is 60. Buprenorphine's only got a number needed to treat of two. So it seems pretty efficacious. Does this line up with your clinical experience? I feel like it does. I mean, I'm just answering anecdotally based on you asking me this now. I don't have numbers to back it up. But that's one of my favorite things about having a hybrid practice of addiction medicine and emergency medicine is getting to see patients that I might have met for the first time when they were in crisis and then help start them on a medicine and then see them not that long later, weeks later or months later, looking like just a completely different person who's functional in society and has hope and does not look like they almost just died. It's so inspiring getting to share upstream and downstream care with my community in a way that just working in the emergency department doesn't afford you and getting to hear patients that I might have seen multiple times in the emergency department come into bridge and tell us, y'all save me. And the fact that it's so easy to get in to see you is part of why this works. So it feels good to be a part of that, especially when there's so many other barriers to care for all patients, but particularly under-resourced patients in the post-COVID era. I remember a couple of weeks ago, this older woman whose sister was struggling with a use disorder for a long time and finally got on MAT. And we were talking to her sister who brought her and she was saying, I feel like I finally have my sister back, which was a meaningful thing for us. And just getting to see the impact of our Narcan distribution from Highland HEPPAC, which is one of the harm reduction services in Alameda County, brings us Narcan, among other things, to pass out to our patients and people who come as guests. And we passed out something like 4,800 boxes of Narcan in two months over the summer. And we know our patients are using it to save lives because they come back to us and say, oh, I, you know that person? I Narcan them and they woke up and went to Highland and that's how they came to this clinic. It feels very real. And it does feel like something that it doesn't take that much use of as a practitioner, as a provider, to see a positive difference in patient outcomes. Okay, you're really in an interesting position in that you get to see them at physiologically some of their worst times when they're in acute withdrawal, they've just been reversed, et cetera, in the emergency department. You start bup on these patients, but then you see them afterwards in clinic as well for continuity as an addiction physician. Walk us through what that looks like to you or an example or two of what that was and how that journey for that patient was during that follow-up. Yeah, that is one of the best parts of having a hybrid career is getting to see people when they're having a downstream crisis and then see them later upstream when they're in their either preventative stage or recovery stage of their disease and unfortunately vice versa sometimes. But I can think of one young man that I've been helping take care of for the last couple of years who has been coming to bridge pretty consistently and has a fentanyl use disorder and will intermittently return to use, which is complicated by the fact that he leaves the area to go care for family who are elsewhere, not infrequently. And so it's hard for him to stay on Suboxone or even when he's getting supplicate injections, it's not always convenient. So I've seen him come in post overdose reverse with Narcan where he almost just died and gotten to see him go from that to being started back on his MAT in the ED and then seeing him again in Bridge two weeks later. And he has himself back and I know him. And so it's nice to get to see him and know that I got to be part of that journey. There are people that I saw in the ED on an almost nightly basis with terrible use disorder and just intoxicated and not ever at a point of any kind of recovery or wellness. And then I would see them in Bridge and be like, oh my gosh, look at you. Like you're on your feet. You're out during the day. I'm getting to meet your family. And these are people I've known for years. Not that I had no hope for them, but I would never have gotten to see that side of them without the hard work they were doing to stay engaged with recovery services. So, Kate, you mentioned earlier this concept of the bridge clinic to get people from the ER back into a primary care clinic, as well as the use of substance use navigators in the emergency department. For those of us in the community that aren't aware of the bridge program in detail and don't know what a substance use navigator is, can you talk me through both the SUN and the bridge program and what that means to me in a primary care practice? Sure. A substance use navigator is a person who is a specialist in the lifestyle of people who use drugs and people who inject drugs. 
often because they themselves have some form of lived experience with substance use, either themselves or someone extremely close to them. And they have now made it their profession to work with us either in the bridge clinic or with different hospitals. Sometimes they're hired directly by the ED or, for example, John George Pavilion, which is the psychiatric facility here in Alameda County, has their own substance use navigator. And they're like a peer liaison who is oftentimes the first point of contact for the patient with recovery services. And so when there is a patient in the emergency department or who is an inpatient at Highland that has an active substance use disorder, once the patient is stable enough for conversation, the substance use navigators will approach them and using trauma-informed language, ask them if they're willing to engage around substance use care and reassure them that they do not have to want to change or share goals with anyone to be served by Bridge and try and build a rapport with them that way. And we actually did a paper at Highland that came out earlier this year. I think Eric Anderson was the first author showing that getting to meet with a substance use navigator in the emergency department was the strongest independent predictor for being engaged in substance use disorder care 30 days out. The people who met with what we call SUNS, substance use navigators, in the ED were three times as likely to still be in care a month later. This is a very powerful intervention. And they're great. They're just salt of the earth, quirky, delightful people that are a pleasure to get to work with. And that was the concept behind California Bridge in the first place was optimizing substance use disorder care in the emergency department by making sure there were on the ground specialists in the form of sons in every ED in California to assist in linking patients to care. That sounds like an awesome program, and I'm glad that we have it in our state. And it's been, personally for me, a huge resource in getting patients connected to care in our system. So, Kay, what can I, as a primary care doctor in a system that doesn't have a lot of bridge access yet, what can I do to help when you're out there getting patients started quickly on BUP, giving them prescriptions and giving them enough to last them until they see me? Should I just start taking them into my practice? How do I get them in, and what can I do to help? That's an interesting question because I think there's – so many different areas of our system that are in crisis from perhaps a primary doctor's already existing patient census to new patients who are out there that aren't linked to care to the family members who are affected. And so I think that there's a lot of different ways to help. And it's part of what can seem so daunting about jumping into addiction medicine if it's something that people don't have a lot of experience with is it's such an overwhelming problem. And we're going one patient at a time to fight this disease that's killing more Americans than car accidents and gunshot wounds combined year by year. So it can seem impossible, but it's really not. And I would say some very simple things to do to start is if you run the type of practice where you can put up posters or have signage or language or something in your practice that says something along the lines of, it's okay to talk to me about drugs, or if you're using and you want to quit, some kind of basic signage or pamphlets that reflects the resources that are either available in your area or that just say, please talk to me about it behind closed doors. And then patients will know that you're approachable and do a little bit of the work to look into what is in your community to refer people to. The clinics that are out there, if you don't already know them, the people running these clinics are very enthusiastic people who want patients to get care and they will be very happy to work with you to tell you how to refer patients to them and how they can refer patients to you and vice versa. And you can look on California Bridge and just start to educate yourself a little bit about the different things you can prescribe or different things to offer, things to look for in your patients. Educate yourself about what harm reduction is in your community, what you can offer. Are there needle exchange services like HEPPAC or places that you can tell patients who aren't ready to change to go get services, which will also increase their retention in your clinic? Even if it's not care that you provide, the fact that you are willing to keep that door open for them is good. But it's hard. The fact that it's such a new problem and such an overwhelming problem can make it easy to feel hopeless and lean into old viewpoints of resentment and complacency. But it doesn't have to be that way. I don't know if you're familiar with the story of the little boy and the starfish. One of my residents told me this story about a little boy that was on a beach that had all these starfish just beached on it. They were just dying. And he was running up to them and throwing them back in the ocean one by one. And there was this old woman watching him. And she said, what are you doing? You can't save them all. 
And he reached down and picked one up and threw it in. And he said, yeah, but I saved that one. And so we can make a difference. That's such a great story. I really appreciate that. That really puts it into perspective. Okay, you've given us a lot of good info, especially coming from the perspective of an emergency physician prescribing it acutely, but then seeing them in clinic as well, which is what we do on our side. So lots of good advice there. Any last words of advice or tips or tricks you'd like to share with the audience before we wrap it up? Yes. I actually was lucky enough to attend the Canadian Society of Addiction Medicine conference in October, which was really cool. If anybody in the audience ever has a chance to go, I recommend it highly. And one of their keynote speakers was asked the same question at the end of her talk. And she said, yes, make sure that when you're advocating for your patients, that you advocate for them in the way that you document their care. Because it is very easy to create this long-lasting, deep bias against a patient with the way you document about them. And so be very intentional coming from a place of advocacy when you're documenting about your patients. And don't document the patient didn't take their meds because they just wanted to go get high. And don't document patient comes in screaming about how much he loves meth because of this and that. Document, I spoke with the patient. He tells me the reason he continues to use is that this is what the drug does for him. And then other doctors can keep going where you left off in terms of untangling this person's motivations towards wellness and not see them as someone who is ready to be frightening or abusive or less than human. I thought that was a wonderful way to look at it. That's not something people often bring up as an intentional point, but there's a lot we can do to rehumanize a patient population that's often been the most marginalized with the way that we talk to them and about them, even when no one else is there. Thanks, Kay. I totally agree. The data out there really shows that bridge programs drastically improve the lives of those individuals that are struggling with OUD and really offer them hope for a healthier future and get them connected to medications and care. So kudos to you and all of our emergency medicine colleagues out there that are starting buprenorphine. We as family physicians are the next step in that process is once they're discharged from the emergency department, we should be seeing them in our clinics. And hopefully some of the things you've covered today will empower our listeners out there to really write that buprenorphine prescription when they see them in clinic after ER follow-up. So with that, thanks again, Kay, for your time. Thank you all for listening. And we just want to remind everyone that addiction medicine is just good family medicine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lind, for sharing your story with us. And I appreciate you, Tipu, for continuing to have these conversations and spreading the word about MOUD. I hope that Dr. Lind's story moves everyone who's listening to explore more MOUD in your setting if you aren't already there. And if you're not there, keep listening to our series. This podcast was created, produced, and recorded by the California Academy of Family Physicians. The Family Docs podcast series, One in Five, Increasing the Odds for OUD Patients, is supported by the California Department of Healthcare Services. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities they represent or the California Academy of Family Physicians.